Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. It is Saturday, October 8th. That's right. We have been on the road most of the week, but we still were able to bring you shows. And so here are the highlights from throughout the week. Have a wonderful day, not just a good day. And we'll see you next time on Crime Talk. Well, we all know that Chad DeBell's attorney, a guy by the name of John Pryor, filed a motion for a continuance. And he basically said a lot of the things that basically I've been saying that should have been going on for the last, oh, 16 months since the, since the indictment came down. And even the year before that, when these charges were actually filed, as it related to specifically the abandonment of children. Anyway, John Pryor has filed this motion, and it's basically saying that he has just been too busy. And wait till you get to uh, the language here. All right, now let's first talk about the law. Now, when a defense attorney asks on behalf of his client, the defendant, to continue a jury trial, it implicates a lot of matters. First, speedy trial. Obviously, in Idaho, it's a six-month speedy trial date from the date that the defendant says not guilty. However, you can waive that speedy trial date, and usually a six-month period begins along those lines. You can also toll it, which means you're going to waive it, and we're going to toll it from beginning again for, let's say, another 90 days so that you can have more time to prepare. Well, this case has been going on, and we know that it's set for trial to begin in January of 2023. Well, is that going to happen? Well, let's take a look what the legal standard is. So while determining uh, whether in any case a continuance should be granted, that normally rests within the sole discretion of the trial court, but that discretion may not be exercised in such a manner as to deprive the defendant a reasonable opportunity to prepare his defense. And although a judge's goal of expediting the adjudication of cases, though laudable, should not blind a judge to a fault that he cannot be doubted that the right to counsel guaranteed by both the federal and state constitutions. Now, although there's plenty of case law out there about a judge's goal of expediting the adjudication of cases, and I assure you, judges keep track of how old cases are getting. Why do they do that? Well, usually the Supreme Court, state court administrator keeps track of all the cases, how long they take to resolve, and basically the judges are evaluated sometimes or it goes up into consideration of how effectively and efficiently they move cases through. But just because that's a laudable goal, uh, they cannot uh, basically override their efficiency measures if it is going to override one's Sixth Amendment right to counsel. And that right to counsel effectively throws in the right to effective assistance of counsel. And there's sufficient case law out there that stands for the fundamental principle that a fundamental part of the constitutional right of an accused to be represented by counsel is that his attorney is obviously entitled to the aid of expert assistance, and he may need that in preparing a defense. An accused also has a constitutional right to put on a defense, and an accused has the right to present exculpatory evidence. Courts have reversed several convictions for failing to allow the defendant to put on a defense, and they've also found that cases need to be reversed if the defense counsel did not provide effective assistance of counsel. Now, a lot of that required language is in the motion. Let's go through the exact language of the motion, which is probably going to get a continuance in this particular case. And I'm referring specifically to the motion to continue filed by Mr. Pryor. Specifically, Mr. Pryor states, since the indictment on capital murder charges approximately 16 months ago, counsel's time has been dominated by litigating numerous issues with the indictment process, discovery, the legal authority of prosecutors in this case, and a host of other matters, as well as reviewing voluminous discovery in a case that the prosecution has repeatedly referred to as particularly complex due to conspiracy charges, the fact there are two co-defendants and others alleged co-conspirators, and that investigation is occurring across jurisdictions for multiple alleged homicides, which are alleged to have occurred months apart. 
undersigned counsel has been handling this extremely complex case alone until this point and is currently seeking qualified co-counsel in accordance with the ABA guidelines for capital defense, as well as the practical necessity of having more than one lawyer in a case this complex. At the current time, we have been unable to secure co-counsel if and when co-counsel is hired. That attorney will require sufficient time to become well acquainted with the entire case to ensure decisions are informed and made strategically in accordance with the professional norms for capital cases. And he cites the United States Supreme Court case of Strickland, which lays out the requirements for effective assistance to counsel. Thus, co-counsel will require time to independently review all of the discovery and get up to date on the defense investigation and all of the litigation completed to date. Counsel will thereafter need sufficient time to consider and analyze legal issues and strategies, and ultimately will require time to litigate issues that arise out of this process. A qualified attorney could not possibly complete the required work in only four remaining months before a January 23rd trial date. Additionally, the investigation into the merits phase remains ongoing. The prosecution has recently made a request for additional DNA testing, and several discovery items still have not been turned over to the defense. Though the prosecution has no less than five attorneys working on this case, five times the manpower of undersigned counsel, they have not yet complied with their discovery obligations. Defense counsel is entitled to, and indeed required by the ABA guidelines, to independently examine, with the assistance of qualified experts, every piece of evidence the state intends to use at trial. Thus, the state's delay hinders counsel's ability to complete the necessary investigation prior to the current trial date. The pretrial litigation necessary in this case is also far from complete. Death penalty cases typically require hundreds of pretrial motions, and undersigned counsel has not yet had time to research and litigate issues that are unique to the death penalty due to the ongoing focus of evidentiary issues and other issues specific to the prosecution of this case. As discussed above, it is a fundamental duty of trial counsel to preserve all possible legal issues, particularly the ones that bear on legality of appropriateness of a sentence of death, necessitating the time and opportunity to do so. Finally, a continuance is necessary because the mitigation investigation cannot possibly be completed in five months. As detailed above, the mitigation investigation includes gathering numerous records generated about the client during the course of his life in addition to the records of family members. Capital mitigation investigation generally results in thousands of pages of records. The investigation also requires interviewing immediate and extended family, friends, neighbors, teachers, church personnel, employers, colleagues, classmates, girlfriends, social services, and others who have known the client during his life. This is time consuming and expensive, but it is mandatory in light of the prosecution's choice to continue to seek the death penalty. In the event the prosecution chooses not to seek the death penalty in this case, counsel could likely proceed to trial in early 2023. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have told you this in the past. I have only done one death penalty case. It started out as a death penalty case, and then they decided not to seek death penalty because we presented mitigation. That was one of the first things we did in that case because we wanted to jump on the matter quickly. Now, it's been 16 months since the indictment in this particular case, and it was almost another year before that when charges were actually filed against Vallow and Daybell. Now, I get it. Chad Daybell hired John Pryor, who is a sole practitioner, but a sole practitioner cannot do this case alone. I've mentioned this before. It's very unusual. Of course, we couldn't tell for sure because the court blocks all the motions, but I was very surprised by the lack of number of motions that had been filed, at least that we can tell up to this point, because usually they challenge the death penalty, the constitutionality of it. Uh, they filed the motions like Lori Vallow's uh, attorneys filed the other day, basically saying you got to do away with the whole death penalty selection process. Those are types of things that are litigated on a routine basis an experienced death penalty attorney would probably know that. He would also have a resource, a database to go through to do that. It would appear as though, according to the, according to the statements made by an officer of the court, to the court saying basically, hey, judge, I just really haven't had time. And oh, by the way, now, here we are, 16 months into this, I probably better find a qualified death penalty co-counsel. But we haven't been able to do that. Attorneys are expensive. 
Most people cannot afford a private death penalty attorney. Why? Because first of all, it's an expensive endeavor because the attorney is going to be working on it nonstop. And it's going to be a team of attorneys. Most death penalty teams usually consist of two attorneys and a and when I mean attorneys, two trial attorneys, there's usually an appellate attorney on there as well to basically file motions, set the trap for any appellate issues, an investigator, a mitigation expert, if social workers, it is usually a team of between five and 10 people on a death penalty case. And they're working on it literally full time. Nobody can afford that type of situation unless you are independently wealthy. All right. So it seemed to make sense that maybe the way to get a continuance here for Chad Daybell is for Mr. Pryor to withdraw and ask that court appointed counsel proceed in his place. There's simply no way that this is going to happen. Now, I also see the effort by Mr. Pryor to basically say, hey, you take death off the table. We can go to trial. No problem. We got this handled. Right. But he's got to meet his mitigation requirements under the Sixth Amendment, under death penalty litigation to investigate family and kids and medical records. And you know, who knows to come up with what? Who's paying for this? There's no way, I've, I mean, maybe they're independently wealthy, but I would find it hard to believe that Chad DeBell's family could afford to pay not one, but two, plus experts and investigators to do this matter. It would seem as though maybe now is the time for the counsel for Mr. Daybell to say, you know what, you'd be in better hands if you got the public defender or court appointed counsel to litigate this and it buys you a continuance as well. Oh, and he also notes that there's DNA evidence that was basically recently requested. First, you got to, why is the prosecutor just doing that now? And yes, the defense has to consult with a DNA expert regarding this process to fulfill his ethical obligations as well, particularly because it's a death penalty case. We've mentioned this before, you get super due process in a death penalty case. So what does this really mean for the hearing on October 13th when this should come up? Well, if the state is going to persist in their demand that if convicted, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell should get the death penalty, it would seem as though Chad Daybell is going to get his continuance laid out all the groundwork and the judge has to make sure that basically the defendant is receiving effective assistance of counsel and mr pryor has all but stated judge i'm not effective at this point i will be ineffective in the future so you have to give me a continuance we shall see what oh actually we won't be able to see it since the judge denied cameras we will hear what takes place on October 13th. Maybe the judge won't change his mind on that one as well. Lori Vallow wants a continuance, a motion that was filed yesterday by Lori Vallow's uh, attorneys basically states, well, let's talk it to, about it. The attorneys for Lori Vallow, Jim Archibald and John Thomas, filed a motion to continue the trial, to toll time limits and to stay the case. Now you may say, Scott, what the heck does that mean? Why do they not want to go to trial? Well, let's talk about it here. They state in their motion, trial is currently set on January 9th of 2023, and a final pretrial conference is set for November 9th of 2022. The time limit to file written notice of our intention to raise any issue of mental condition under Idaho Code Title 18 is 90 days before trial or October 11th. And then in a big redacted paragraph, they state what they want to do. Of course, that's been redacted, so we don't get to see it. And then in the final paragraph, it says, because of big redaction, the defense asked for the tolling of the time limit in which to comply with the pretrial orders, a continuance of the pretrial date, and a continuance of the trial date. Now, being the inquisitive people that you are, you may say, Scott, what is uh, applicable under Title 18 of the Idaho Code. Well, we have pulled that relevant section for you. And that is Title 18-207, it's Crime and Punishment of the Idaho Codes. And what it says is mental condition, not a defense. And it says specifically under paragraph one, 
mental condition shall not be a defense to any charge of criminal conduct, which is basically their way of saying, we don't have not guilty by reason of insanity. However, like all statutes, you must read on. And here it says, nothing herein is intended to prevent the admission of expert evidence on the issue of any state of mind, which is an element of the offense subject to the rules of evidence. Hmm. So what does that mean? It basically means, hey, you can't run NGRI, not guilty by reason of insanity. But if somebody has some sort of mental disease or defect, guess what? It can go directly to their state of mind. Remember, in any criminal offense, you must be able to show, the prosecution must be able to show, that the conduct was done knowingly. You knew what you were doing. You were aware of the conduct. You appreciated the circumstances of the event. But if you're crazy, guess what? You're not going to be able to show that there was that mental intent. And what do we know? We know that Lori Vallow was not competent to proceed for some 10 months. The real question is, when did that basically not being competent begin? Was it when, I don't know, she's allegedly involved in the killing of her ex-husband in Arizona? Was it when the kids disappeared in Idaho? That is a question of fact for the jury to decide. And so where is that information going to come in? Well, medical records right? The medical records and evaluations that took place. And so why is this hearing important? Well, because under the statute 18-207 paragraph 4a, notice must be given at least 90 days in advance of trial that a party intends to raise any issue of mental condition and to call expert witnesses concerning such issue and failing with such witness shall not be permitted to testify until such time as the opposing party has a complete opportunity to consider the substance of such testimony and prepare for rebuttal through such opposing experts as the parties may choose. Well, guess what? When competency was raised, and different, there's a difference between competency and suffering from a mental disease or defect, but they usually run hand in hand, okay? And so, as you may recall, way back when, when the competence issue was raised and the report came in saying that Lori Vallow was not competent to proceed, the prosecution confessed the motion. They said, yeah, you're right. We agree. She's not competent. It'll be interesting to see if the prosecution uses this time, which is permitted under the statute, to come up with their own expert to say, well, she really wasn't that crazy. She understood. She appreciated what was going on. So it is now going to get interesting. Bottom line, though, is I don't think we're going to have a trial in January when you consider this request with the request of Chad Daybell through his attorney, Mr. John Pryor. Basically, as we talked about yesterday, go check out the video, who basically says, Judge, I'm not prepared. I would provide ineffective assistance of counsel to Mr. Daybell if I was forced to go to trial on January 9th. One other motion was filed, and that was a motion filed by the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. And basically, it's in response to being an interested party in regards to the motion filed by Lori Hellas. And it states, the department understands the relief requested in the motion of non-party movement to unseal court documents and transcripts or recordings of past hearings and is not proposing any further action by the department at this time. Basically, what they're saying is, is as an interested party, we don't intend to interfere. We're going to leave it completely up to the court. So maybe, just maybe, we're going to get some more access to what's really going on. And I stress how important it is for the courts to be open and transparent with the public in this particular situation. And I understand there are certain things regarding mental health issues that are probably not going to be released. But just think, ladies and gentlemen, the motions that we've been talking about have gleaned more information about what's really going on in this case than what the court thus far has allowed us to see. So hopefully we're starting to see a bit of an easing of some of these unduly burdensome restrictions in this case. Next on the docket, Alec Baldwin.
We've talked about this case. Obviously, he faces potential criminal liability for the death of Helena Hutchinson on the movie set down in Santa Fe, New Mexico for the movie Rust. Well, there was a lot of civil cases, and one of the most important ones is the wrongful death suit filed by Helena Hutchinson's husband. Well, for an undisclosed sum of money and some other things, possibly rights to the movie themselves, guess what? The matter has been settled. Well, why would it matter? It, the jury would never hear about it if criminal charges are filed, if there's a civil matter. Well, guess what? If you can control the victim and they don't want a criminal matter, best way to do that is to make them go away, make them happy. If you settle the matter, you don't have to do a deposition, which is your testimony under oath, which you are locked into, uh, and that can be used against you, obviously, in the criminal proceeding. Now, anything that Mr. Baldwin has said can be used against him as a statement against interest by a party opponent. And so, you know, those interviews that he did with the networks, yeah, where he said the gun couldn't have gone off. Well, guess what? The FBI has already refuted that and said there's no way that firearm could have discharged but for the fact that Alec Baldwin had pulled the trigger. We'll continue to watch this story as it develops. All right. So the other day, Chad Daybell, through his attorney, John Pryor, filed several motions in the case, and the government was able to turn them around rather quickly. And surprisingly, these responses were actually made public somewhat quickly. I'm not sure what's going on, but perhaps the court is realizing through the work of Lori Ellis that you got to put the information out to the public. Well, as you may recall, one of the motions filed by John Pryor was that he and his client, Chad Daybell, wanted to have cameras in the courtroom. The government's response was, hey, the attorneys for Lori Vallow filed their motion objecting to cameras back on August 30th of 2022. The state responded by September 15th saying, we didn't object. There was a hearing set for the 15th of September. The court had reached out to John Pryor to see if he was going to be present and whether his client wanted to be present. Mr. Pryor apparently responded to the court that neither he nor his client were going to be present. And then, of course, he filed a motion. So what is the prosecution's position on cameras in the courtroom? Too late. You waived your right to it. The issue's been settled. We had attorneys for uh, various newspaper outlets and other interested parties, and Mr. Pryor didn't show up. You showed up too late, and you don't get to participate. That's the way it works in court. There's deadlines. You have to respond. If you do not respond, guess what? It is deemed waived. I think, I hope I'm wrong. Maybe somebody will change their mind, but the government is probably correct on this particular issue. You snooze, you lose. Next, there was a motion filed about grand jury transcripts and specifically grand jury transcripts of not the grand jury that indicted Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, but a grand jury that apparently met sometime in December of 2021. Well, normally grand jury proceedings are secret unless and until an indictment comes down. Nobody gets those transcripts unless and until an indictment is returned. Well, apparently the government's basically saying, we're not saying we did have a grand jury because those are supposed to be secret. But if we did, apparently no other crimes were charged and therefore you still wouldn't be entitled to any of the transcripts either way. So prosecution is probably correct on this one, but John Pryor is doing what he can for his client, Chad Day Bell, trying to get as much information as possible. I just do not understand why the court in this particular case has not set a deadline for all motions. You file them. If you don't file by a particular date, you don't get to keep relitigating that. We'll see. The next motion that was filed was a bill of particulars on behalf of Chad Day Bell. And once again, we've talked about this. A bill of particulars is when you look at the charging documents and maybe the prosecution didn't specify which subsection of a statute that the defendant is charged under and say, judge, I just throw up my hands. I do not know. I cannot figure it out. I need a bill of particulars. Please tell me what I need to know. Well, guess what? Guess what the prosecution's response was? Well, you're just trying to get into our theory of the case and uh, we're not gonna give that to you. And guess what else they said? They said that this motion for a bill of particulars is supposed to be filed within 28 days of the day of the indictment. 
a little bit of time has passed, some 16 months in fact, and now you're just getting around to it, trying to say you don't know what's going on. The prosecution obviously believes that the indictment is clear. This issue's already been kind of litigated by Lori Vallow's attorneys when they said, hey, you need to go back and clear it up with the grand jury. And the judge said, no, close enough for government work. We'll just keep it right here. And they also say, hey, the court has no authority to do this because we believe it is uh, crystal clear. So that's the new news in the Lori Vallow case. The theme of the day would be you're too late. You're too late. So some big news broke yesterday after we had completed our video. And yesterday's video is important. So if you have not checked it out yet, please go do so. But here's today's story. Here we go again. That's right. The proceedings have been stayed in the Lori Vallow matter. And as you may recall, Lori Vallow's attorney had made a request to stay the case so they could obtain records necessary to fulfill their requirements under the statutes in Idaho to raise a mental health defense. So the court set a hearing for yesterday to address the issue. Apparently, Lori's attorneys raised the issue of competency via an ex parte motion. Ex parte means one-sided, so it was filed directly with the court. The prosecutors didn't even know what was in that motion. Now, as you may recall, Mr. Archibald had made statements in court that he thought that Lori Vallow's mental state was very fragile. And I read that to mean the basically to say the doctors may have doped her up to get her to the minimum point where they could say that she was competent, but judge, if she doesn't take her meds, she won't be competent and proceed. The judge granted the motion and Lori is now going to be evaluated to determine if she is in fact competent or not competent. Is this something that can be done at the jail or are they gonna ship her off to the state mental hospital again? Like I said, it took 10 months last time to restore her to competency. So what does that really mean? Does she suffer from a mental disease or defect it makes it so that she cannot appreciate what is really taking place. And then also one of the most common factors is you're unable to assist your counsel. And like I said, this took 10 months to get her to competency last time. And I truly believe that she has mental health issues because the professionals that deal with this type of situation all the time know what someone is doing if they are malingering. So I truly believe that, well, that She's got a mental disease. So we have a couple of things to think about. How long is this process going to take? Does this help Chad DeBell's request for a continuance that was filed and set to be heard on October 13th? I would say, yes, it does. So what should the prosecution do? We learned that they opposed um, both Ballo and DeBell's uh, motion to wear civilian clothes. Why, you may ask? Well, as you may recall, they've been wearing clothes to every court proceeding thus far, something that I have rarely ever seen, even when there are cameras permitted in the courtroom. But the prosecutors have said, hey, guess what? Um, you don't need to dress out for court because you don't have to worry about prejudicing anybody because this isn't going to be on camera. And so therefore, wear your jail garb to court and, you know, you obviously can dress out for trial. Uh, so it's one of those things you can't have it both ways. Now, I have never seen people wear, <laughs> if they're in custody, I've never seen people wear their civilian attire. They always wear their jail garb if they're in custody. It's only at trial and then maybe occasionally at sentencing. And I've only had that a couple of times where somebody was going away for a long time and, you know, they frankly just wanted to wear a suit one last time. The other thing is maybe the prosecution needs to decide if they're going to move this case forward. And the easiest way to do that would be to drop the death penalty against Chad Daybell, since his attorney said that he'd be ready to proceed in January if the death penalty wasn't on the table. Maybe drop it against Lori Vallow because it's unlikely any death sentence, if they even get to that point, would be held up on appeal with all of her mental health issues. This case needs resolution, and that may be the fastest way to get it done. Let me know in the comments what you think the prosecutor should do. Go try this case or continue to seek the death penalty. Let me know in the comments.